If you haven't seen Verdun, you haven't seen anything. So wrote a French soldier from the front in 1916. It was in fact just outside Verdun that one of the bloodiest battles in human history and one of the decisive acts of World War I was fought. A carnage said by many to be unnecessary. The French believed that a network of fortifications around Verdun was invincible and unconquerable and had deployed much of their artillery elsewhere, while the Germans intended to take advantage of this mistake and force the enemy to concentrate the bulk of their troops here and bleed them dry under the blows of their own artillery. More than a thousand guns of various calibers, including the fearsome Big Bertha, supplied by two million shells. Verdun was of vital importance to the French, and they would defend it at great cost. It's believed that every French soldier employed in World War I fought for at least one day at Verdun. Bad tactics, intensive bombing, and the use of gas weapons did the rest. Even today, we still don't know for sure how many soldiers took part in the fighting that saw the French and German armies face each other for 300 days, from February 21 to December 19, 1916. Not to mention the casualties, between injured, dead and missing, the number could easily reach a million. As would later happen in Stalingrad, Verdun became a symbol of resistance and heroism, but also of suffering, death and madness. One had to have passed through Verdun to truly understand the horrors of war, argued the unknown French soldier, and Verdun still has much to teach us today. If we want to get a taste of what the world might be like at the end of a world conflict always just around the corner, a trip there can give us some answers, even 106 years later. At the end of the war, despite the victory and triumph, a real scar remained on that slice of northeastern France. The bombing had destroyed villages and devastated the landscape. Many unexploded bombs still undermined the land, and somewhere underground there must still have been bunkers loaded with weapons, gases and chemical compounds. And among those fields and forests still lay buried the remains of untold numbers of fallen men and animals, in quantities and conditions that made all recovery and burial impossible. The French government, in the aftermath of the end of the war, merely isolated some 1,200 square kilometers of death and destruction and proceeded with the first superficial reclamation works, hoping that nature would take its course. The few residents who remained after the war were moved out, and all agricultural use was prohibited on that land. Villages still intact were abandoned, and those destroyed by bombing, such as Duamont, never rebuilt. It was clear that the total reclamation work would take years, if not centuries. It was called Zone Rouge, Red Zone, a non-contiguous wasteland extended between Lille and Nancy, passing of course through Verdun. The Zone Rouge is, in other words, a land poisoned by the chemical waste of unexploded ordnance, by lead, mercury and arsenic, by the toxic refluxes released by animal carcasses and buried human remains. The Zone Rouge basically corresponds to what was the front line that is, the area where the fighting and with it the destruction was total. All life is all but denied in this zone. Vegetation doesn't grow, and if a human being even managed to escape the detonation of some unexploded ordnance, he or she would be immediately infected by a lethal mix of chemical and toxic agents. Think that the arsenic levels recorded within this area are around 179 mg per kilogram, when in Italy, for example, the maximum allowable limit is just 20 mg. However, the French government has carried out remediation works over the years, at least in the least compromised areas, so much so that as of today, the Zone Rouge is restricted to only 100 square kilometers. Some areas are no longer off limits, but according to experts, at this rate, it will still take 700 years to fully secure the area. On the other hand, however, the gradual reclamation of land considered now cleared and handed back too quickly to the population has ended up exposing farmers and the entire communities to the slow action of the remaining chemicals. This is because the cleanup work was often conducted rushed and superficial. Nature hasn't helped, as recent surveys have found even higher amounts of arsenic in the soil than those recorded in the past. Despite this, farming and hunting have returned to the recovered territories. The French government and the European Union monitor products from the region, but it's clear that stricter controls would cause damage to the local economy already suffering from a century of living with the poisons of war. Of course, men's reckless actions have also added to the situation. In fact, one of the most dangerous and 
the poisoned areas of the Zone Rouge is located north of Verdun and is known today as the Place Gas, the gas place. This is where, in the 1920s, Departement du Déminage officers detonated any unexploded ordnance they could locate. In doing so, however, they made the situation worse because these detonations in turn released their own toxic charges into the ground. Just imagine the effects that a mass detonation of thousands of ordnance and munitions may have had on a once verdant wooded landscape. Today, the Plaza Gaz looks like a piece of tundra in the middle of the forests of northeastern France. The soil is now so polluted with ammonium perchlorate and arsenic, whose concentration is 1,000 to 10,000 times higher than natural levels, that only a few lichens and mushrooms manage to grow in this area. What's more, only since 2004 has a scientific study highlighted the danger of the area. First, it was found that the surface layers of this soil, for at least 20 centimeters, consist only of the burning debris. The analysis then found large traces of copper, lead, arsenic and zinc. The Plaza Gas was only fenced off in 2005, and in 2012 entry was formally banned, but the Zone Rouge is only the innermost and most dangerous part of the areas involved in World War I fighting. Even larger is in fact the so-called Yellow Zone, an area that is certainly less dangerous, but still has a number of unexploded ordnance. An estimated 900 tons of ammunition and bombs are recovered each year by French and Belgian authorities. And not only by them, because it also happens, in fact, that these devices are found by farmers at work in the fields. In those parts, they call it Recolte de Fer, the iron harvest. The problem is that under pressure from local communities, a clear distinction between yellow and red zones wasn't often made, and as a result, as we said, some contaminated land was restored to its agricultural use too soon. In short, some stretches of yellow zone may have red zone levels of pollution and hazard, and when abnormal concentrations of toxic substances turn up, authorities always remain vague about the possible causes. And this often happens even beyond the boundaries of red or yellow zones. In 500 municipalities, in the Nord and Pas-de-Calais departments, that is, those regions located further north of Verdun, along the Belgian border, drinking water was banned because of high concentrations of ammonium perchlorate. No one has ever provided an explanation, but the location of the contaminated aquifers corresponds to the places where the most intense fighting took place during the war, which leaves little doubt that these municipalities far from Verdun also suffer from the same problem, even though they don't fall into any red or sometimes even yellow zones. After all, it wasn't only in Verdun that fighting took place. In Metz, further east of Verdun, the local déminage team in charge of clearing the territories of three departments belonging to the old front line registers 900 to 1000 requests for action a year, with a total of 45 to 60 tons of ammunition collected. As long as they are conventional ordnance, all it would take is a little caution and a safe place to detonate them. But about 2% of those collected turn out to be gas weapons loaded with mustard gas and phosgene. Until 1997, such armaments were collected and stored at a specialized site, at Sweep, in the Marne department, not far from Verdun. Given what had happened to the Plaza Gas, it was preferred not to detonate them, at least for the time being. But when France signed a convention prohibiting the possession and use of chemical weapons, those weapons had to be dismantled somehow. So the Sequoia project was initiated. The dismantling site was established at the Maille Comp military base, where the ordnance would be detonated in special chambers starting in 2016, marking the beginning of the toxic waste treatment program for an expected duration of 30 years. What happened in and around Verdun and the heavy legacy that has fallen on generations a century after the battle? is just one emblematic and tragic case in numbers of a certainly more widespread problem that is often ignored. After the war, in fact, almost all belligerent countries hid and stored unused armaments, including chemical weapons. The problem is that many of these locations are unknown, whether they are top secret locations or long forgotten secrets. Staying in France, for example, it was discovered that thousands of tons of armaments and munitions were stored in a submerged chamber under the waters of Lake d'Avrier, or in the caves of Jardel, used as a veritable dumping ground. And the more years passed, the more fragile the casings that retained the toxic charges became. Today, in the parts of Verdun, everything tells of the war. From memorials and charnel houses such as the one in Duamont, to the private collections of farmers who have recovered ammunition and relics from their fields over the years. Many activities revolve around the macabre remembrance of the war. 
tours are organized, that come dangerously close to the red zone, maybe even crossing it. Trenches are reconstructed for the delight of tourists. Unfortunately, it's when we think we have left the nightmares behind that we should pay more attention, and in Verdun the horror of the war is still embedded in the ground. The Zone Rouge in some parts fools us under the appearance of a lush forest, albeit a poisoned one. In other parts, such as the Plaza Gas, it seems instead to have some straight out of the pages of Thomas Eliot's Wasteland, the poem of the post-war fall of man and his land, a barren wasteland where life no longer grows camped with dead trees, where not even the many buried corpses have been able to sprout. Well, also today we have finished our story. Thank you all for your attention and see you in the next video. Ciao!